obviously there is a, an author that you lean on in the book, um, a man called Nassim Taleb. He wrote a book called The Inserto, which is an inquisition, the luck, randomness, opacity, and so forth. Um, and he talks about in different language, serendipity quite a lot. And there is this great sort of way of thinking about the world uh, in the context that he puts it from the black swan, which is that how can we predict a future of infinite possibilities based off our finite experience of the past? You know, because we've, we can, like we just said with Kierkegaard, you can trace it backwards, even though it's completely random it's only understandable in hindsight, but there's an infinite set of possibilities in front of you. So the question becomes, how do I find my best path in this infinite uh, future of possibilities? And that's where serendipity comes into it, right? Which is what your whole message through the book is cultivate that serendipity. So I've got a lot here that I want to say about Taleb, but I just want to first ask, how has he specifically influenced your thinking? And is there other, um, from the scientific side of things, other authors, philosophers who have also really impacted the way you see the world, impacted your worldview? Yeah. You know, this is super fascinating. And thank you so much for, for so beautifully framing it, right? Because I think that's at the core of it, right? That, that, that there's infinite possibility out there. Mm. But, but our, we are too narrow, like our mind is not able to actually, you know, capture it because by definition we can't know, but also our experience is so limited, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think to, to me, you know, that always comes back to the kind of functional fixedness idea also, right? The hammer and nail problem. If, if you think you can use the hammer or, or the hammer is your tool, right? Then each time you want to have a nail in the wall, you're just thinking about the, um, the hammer rather than any kind of heavy object that you could just use to put that in the wall. And I think that limits us in like understanding potentiality because we think we, we have our kind of path like mapped out and, and, and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, Taleb in, in, in a sense, you know, I, I've always, I found it fascinating how he was able to bring the unexpected so prominently into the conversation. I think that was something that, you know, was much needed and, and, and especially kind of when you think about how the world is just not, you know, as controllable as people might think it is. Um, but I think, you know, like authors that, that shaped me a lot um, were especially Adam Grant, um, because he is very much into that idea of how do we, in a world that, you know, incentivizes takers and, and, and those kind of things, but actually giving, making us happier than taking, like how do we set ourselves up for this kind of enlightened self-interest type um, uh, approach? And so he, he's been very inspiring to me in terms of just what is the overall approach to life that can really help us to, to navigate this. And so I've been a big fan of these kind of psychologists slash um, philosophers in, in general, um, but the biggest influence definitely is the, the kind of Socrates type um, philosophers who just, you know, they were just really smart. They said, look, you would got to ask why all the time. And when you start asking why all the time, when you question assumptions, that's when you see more and more potentiality happening, right? Because you, you go deeper and deeper to the root causes, the root dynamics versus just seeing the surface of something. Um, that then doesn't allow us to really connect with some um, problem or person or, or else. So I think those philosophers I've always found extremely inspiring. Okay. Um, so uh, no Leonard Mlodinov or similar to the scientific explanation of randomness and chance type similar to Taleb? You know, it's interesting because I'm a big fan of everything, you know, especially also, I, you know, I when I grew up, like I grew up in a system that mathematics and, and things like that, probability, you would just learn the form and you would be kind of pushed into that. Yeah. And then, so, you know, I was like, oh my God. And then later on, you know, when I started studying and, 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 and like, you know, more the kind of business side of things and, and I was a bit more around the actual ideas behind it. Like, why is it actually useful? What can we do with this for our own life? Then I realized, wow, there's a lot of beautiful mindness in that, right? There's a lot yeah. of kind of philosoph philosophical beauty in mathematics, right? There's a lot of- oh, 100%, beauty, yeah. Right? And so I think um, to that point, right, I've, I've always felt it's almost like this kind of thing where, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel very attracted to the kind of more philosophical, psychological uh, types. And then I feel the mathematical in a way gives us like a nice foundation, right? So mm -hmm. when you think about things like the birthday paradox, right, like that's a probabilistic idea that like in a way, in a room of 23 people, you will have a likelihood of 50% that two people have the same birthday. And, mm -hmm. and, and you can explain that mathematically, right? Because it's an exponential function where mm -hmm. person number 23 
will have 22 people. And then if it's not the same person, 22 will have 21 people and so on. And so it's kind of an exponential function, which again, like when we think about the world, explains us why there's so much, to your point, infinite possibility out there, because there's just so many variables we can't know. And so long story short, I find these things super fascinating to substantiate a lot of the mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that actually are about serendipity. Um, this is the real inspiration I feel comes a lot of times from the kind of, you know, like why questioning type uh, people out there. I think uh, you transitioning to the birthday paradox is perfect because the birthday paradox, paradox can provide an allegory for how much more we have in common with each other than you would otherwise think. And therefore, how much more chance there is for serendipity than, uh, than you would otherwise think. And say, so I would ask you to please um, unpack the birthday paradox for us. And then for the listener, think about how next time you're in a room with 23 people, whether it's the fucking gym or a restaurant or your friend's dinner party, there is going to be some obscure stuff that you guys have in common that you can build serendipity uh, off of. And it is explained fantastically in your book, The Birthday Paradox, which I'll ask you to unpack. And it's rooted in math. It, it is a principle of the universe <laughs> that this is provable. So please go for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think to your point, right, the, the uh, again, the, the base laws, logic is, right, we assume that life is linear, like step by step. We assume, right, there's, in this example, if I would ask you, hey, what do you think is the probability of 23 people in a room, um, you know, two of them having the same birthday, you will probably divide 23 and 365, right? Because that's the kind of quote unquote linear approach we're so used to, where we just look at that in that kind of unidimensional way. And then we end up with a very low probability, right? So we would assume, oh my God, it's extremely unlikely that two of us have, uh, uh, or that two people have the same birthday. Um, but then obviously what happens is really to say, well, hey, um, you know, it's a, an exponential function. As I just mentioned, you kind of, in a way, have all these potential, if you would draw it, right? Like all these potential links, you could draw two different people. And I loved what you just did in terms of saying, how does that apply to life in general? What does that apply to life in general in terms of, if I just talk with you and I assume that you're a unidimensional person, you're the yeah. linear person I assume, I ask you, what do you do? You will be in that box, right? There's not much I can connect with you. But if I ask you, you know, what makes you come alive at the moment? Just making this up, right? Mm -hmm. You could then talk about, oh my God, you know, I got into podcasting because like I, I, my grandmother did this, but then actually this happened and this happened. And then it gives me so many potential dots where I could say, oh my God, such a coincidence. Mm -hmm. My grandmother also X, Y, Z. Oh my God, such a coincidence. I also got inspiration from there and there. So I think what we're really talking about here is when you map the world or not the world, but when you met potentiality as all these potential dots that are out there, if you usually only focus on one or two dots because you narrowly try to define a problem or a person, you miss out on all that potentiality that the person yeah. or the problem out there might have. And so I think if you take that into the organizational context, right, a lot of times that's it. If you just tell someone reduce costs, they will think about a lot of ways to reduce costs. If you tell them, think about how we can do better as a company, being that costs or revenues or whatever it is, they will think much bigger, right? Maybe it means increasing the price, um, and making a better product, right? And so it's really about saying, how do you open the potential opportunity space so that more of those dots can connect?